for those of you on this side of the restaurant, uh, we're having a meetup and a, a tiny, a small lecture. So I uh, hope that you enjoy it. I'm um, sorry that you'll be interrupted in some ways by our meeting, but uh, this is the Greater Boston Humanist Group, and we're meeting here at uh, the India Pavilion again. Welcome and uh, thank you for uh, coming. Yeah. We have, um, we've had a nice lunch here and we're sort of celebrating together our last time this year, which, so this is our kind of holiday celebration. And most of you are familiar with the group. Uh, fortunately, a few of the guests who came to uh, see our speaker had to leave early because of uh, a train that they took down from Lowell. So I'm glad that we have such great public transportation here, um, that we can come together even on such an adverse weather day, which we're quite lucky to have. Um, bad luck, that is. So as, as you all probably know, humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism and other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. Aspire to the greater good of humanity. That's the part that's in the Humanist Manifesto um, summary that we are going to really focus in on today with our speaker. Um, there's a lot of different secular groups in the Boston area and in this country and uh, some of us in the movement, if you can call it a movement, have begun to question some of the history and roots of our uh, organization. And today we'll talk a little bit about the history, about where it comes from as a philosophy of life, and how it relates to politics today. So to introduce our speaker, here is our erstwhile member, Jim Farmerland. Okay, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Doug Green, who is an independent Marxist historian who's published in many different venues, including Links, the International Journal of Socialist Renewal. He's published in Cultural Logic. He is published in Jacobin, Counterpunch, International Socialist Renewal. MR Zane as well, and probably a few others mentioned here. But Doug is the author of a book, Communist Insurgent, Blanke's Politics of Revolution, which has very recently been released by the Market Books, and is about the life of the 19th century French revolutionary, Louis Auguste Blanke. And no doubt in due time, of course, Doug will be have more articles and more books. So, thank you. Take care, Blake. I do want to thank the Greater Boston Humanists for inviting me today. And uh, I do also want to add that this book is for sale. I have copies that I'm happy to sell to you for $20. Unfortunately, I will not be making much money off of it, so that's the price. If you want to not buy it here, you can order it online through Haymarket Books or Amazon. And you can also harass uh, all sorts of good booksellers to sell. Uh, this talk is not directly on the book, but it does deal with several of the themes. And unfortunately, as is a problem for most talks with Blanc, it's a rather obscure, neglected figure. It means there's some inside baseball talk, which I'm happy to get into during the Q&A. And if you're also interested in just discussing this figure more in depth then, that's perfectly fine. And I also wanted to add to probably the shame of my cousin that this is dedicated to her new son, Finley William, who's two months old today. Unfortunately, haven't met him yet since he lives over in the UK. And the book is actually dedicated to uh, Finley's older sister, who's uh, Isla, who's my little friend. And, and so this is uh, Blanke and the Communist Enlightenment. And uh, anyhow, currently the principles of the Enlightenment are under attack from several fronts. On the one hand, there are fascists and religious fundamentalists who stand for the destruction of reason and are opposed to both democracy and equality. 
On the other hand, large segments of the quote-unquote left have rejected Enlightenment-inspired grand narratives as inherently oppressive and totalitarian. Now that the Enlightenment is under attack, the left stands on the same philosophical grounds as the right, making them ill-equipped to defend universalist principles. Other so-called defenders of the Enlightenment, whether liberals or social democrats, offer no positive alternative to reactionaries. They are stalwart defenders of the status quo of capitalism, wars, and racism. However, there is another option represented by the revolutionary Louis Auguste Blanqui, who believed that the legacy of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution was worth defending. Blanqui recognized that this was not enough, though. Bourgeois society is inherently incapable of fulfilling the promises of the Enlightenment. He understood that the only way to realize the universalist principles of liberté, égalité, and fraternity meant the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism and the establishment of communism. But before we get into Blanqui, let's talk about the Enlightenment itself. At the heart of the Enlightenment worldview are three claims. The first is that both the natural and social worlds can be understood and acted upon through reason, without resorting to religion or God. If the conditions we live under are not the result of divine fate, but man-made, then they can potentially be unmade. The implications for this are that the conditions that people live under... The second claim is that human history moves in a particular direction, characterized by progress, as opposed to regression, stagnation, or recurrence. The final claim is that human beings possess universal rights, irregardless, ir uh, I'm sorry, irrespective of their class, religion, or state. They have these rights simply because they're human. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, these new ideas were utilized by the rising class known as the bourgeoisie in order to attack the divine right of kings, backwardness, privileges associated with monarchies, the Catholic Church, and the nobility. Even though the implications of the Enlightenment place it on, this, on a collision course with the feudal order, this was not desired by the majority of its adherents. Most uh, philis, uh, uh, Enlightenment philosophers were reformers of one sort or another, who wrote for other managers of, the no of their class, the nobility, not the common people. According to Voltaire, it is not the laborers one should educate, but the good bourgeois, the tradesmen. They view the vast majority of people with contempt and beyond the reach of reason because they were under the control of superstition in the church. While the questioning of religion by men of property was perfectly acceptable, it was beyond the pale for common people to do so. The enlightened bourgeoisie saw great value in religion in protecting private property by teaching the poor to accept their faith, be submissive, obey their masters, and remain in blessed ignorance. Both conservative Enlightenment thinkers and the nobility shared a common fear that if ordinary people took up reason and criticized religion, it could open a Pandora's box, leading to anarchy. After all, free thinking not only challenges the existence of God, but the doctrines of the Bible and the Church. If divine authorities were open and supposedly, unal and al supposedly unalterable truths are open to attack, then it is a small step to asking dangerous questions such as why should, why should we have kings? Why should we accept the exploitation that religion upholds? There was no telling how far the Enlightenment would go if it got out of hand. Despite their fears, the Enlightenment philosophers could not help challenging the existing pillars of feudal society that was irreformable. During the French Revolution, these, these uh, opposed worldviews exchanged the weapon of criticism for criticism by weapons. Theory moved to practice. In a scant few years, France overthrew their king and proclaimed the rights of man and citizen. None of this would have been possible without the intervention of ordinary people who had taken up the Enlightenment ideas as their own. Independent craftsmen and artisans picked up these ideas and popular, popularized them for ordinary people. This popular movement, combined with the radical bourgeoisie, fa radical bourgeois faction known as the Jacobins, created a a radical republic in the years of 1793 and 4, with sweeping social and democratic rights. The Jacobins were guided by the Enlightenment and the determination to achieve them with terror against real internal and external enemies. According to Robespierre, if the spring of popular government in time of peace is virtue, the spring of popular government in revolution are at once virtue and terror. 
Virtue without which terror is fatal, terror without which virtue is powerless. Terror is nothing than justice, prompt, severe, and flexible. It is therefore an emanation of virtue. The experience of Jacobinism and the French Revolution did reveal a split in the Enlightenment philosophy between what uh, two good two friends of mine, Harrison Fluss and Landon Frim, describe as the moderate and the radical Enlightenments. Most of the bourgeoisie favored a moderate Enlightenment with a constitutional monarchy that would protect private property. On the other hand, there was the radical Enlightenment. The radical Enlightenment was represented by the sans colliots, the peasants and the working class, who had fought the great battles of the French Revolution. For them, the revolution gave them the opportunity to articulate their own radical demands. They were not simply fighting to establish bourgeois rule, but in the words of one historian, they were making their own revolution and their enemy was privilege and oppression, whether clerical, noble, or bourgeois in form. According to Fluss and Friend, the radical enlightenment implies an intelligible universe. It requires uniform natural laws and predictable cause and effect relation. It precludes divine intervention, the spontaneity of wills, or radical evil. The great conflicts in history, the drivers of class, of class conflict, are all material. Using the tools of this tradition, we can understand that capitalism separates society into two fundamentally opposed classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. This means that the exploitation of workers is not an act of divine faith, but something you can understand through the use of dialectical reason. To discover common universal interest requires a corresponding concept of universal human nature that recognizes the existence of material needs for safety, security, and free development. Lacking this conception of human nature, neither a classless society nor international solidarity can be created. Realizing these human needs can only come from a system based on cooperation and association. In other words, capitalism is incapable of filling, fulfilling these needs, but communism can. Here was the choice between the two roads of the Enlightenment. If the Enlightenment took a model in force favor by the bourgeoisie, then it would fulfill, stop, stop short of fulfilling its ultimate goals. If the radical rule was taken, and the Enlightenment took its principles to its logical conclusion, then it had to move beyond the limits of bourgeois society in order to realize the promises of liberté, equality, and fraternity. And this brings us to Louis-Auguste Blanqui. So who is he? He lived from 1805 to 1881. Arguably, he was the most revered, dedicated, and uncompromising revolutionaries of the 19th century. He participated in five abortive revolutions from 1830 to 1870. Every French government since 1830 had seen fit to lock him up, hoping to silence his uncompromising voice. But Blanqui never broke or surrendered, but emerged from the dungeons every time to fight again for a republic and equality. He was primarily a man of action who refused to develop elaborate theories, believing that organizing an insurrection, not utopian plans, could lead to an egalitarian society. While Blanqui did not produce much in the way of a distinctive theory or philosophy, this did not mean that he lacked either. In fact, Blanqui clearly stated that any revolutionary effort must be based on the principles of the Enlightenment. And he said very clearly, and I quote, the philosophy inaugurated in the 18th century by Diderot and Holbach, proclaimed and promulgated in the 19th century as the unanimous verdicts of science, is the only possible basis for the future. The experiment is over. All the abortions of the revolution since 1789 are due to the abandonment of this philosophy. One must choose between it or the Middle Ages. It will be our flag. Clear, unambiguous, uncompromising. It is a philosophical stand. A revolutionary politics requires a revolutionary philosophy. For Blanqui, communists or revolutionaries must be guided by enlightenment rationality, which is based on the belief that the universe is essentially knowable and our ignorance is thereby temporary. For him, the condition of exploitation, again, is not divinely ordained, but something that can be understood and overcome through collective struggle. One historian of Blanqui describes him as the political manifestation of the French Revolution in the 19th century, and this was no exaggeration. Blanqui proudly stood for and defended the principles of the French Revolution throughout his life. For Blanqui, the Jacobins stood for the Enlightenment, secularism, republicanism, and egalitarianism. 
he noted that he noted that taking a Jacobin position was to choose sides in the class struggle. As he said, we are always and everywhere for the oppressed, against the oppressor. And we say with Song Jus, the wretched are the powerful of the earth. As a good black, uh, Jacobin, Blanqui's allegiance lay with the forces of progress and the enlightenment. He represented the interests of the people. And Blanqui understood that these struggles of 1789 and after, between progress and reaction, still define contemporary politics. As he said in 1851, and I quote, whoever now reads the history of our first revolution also reads the, about our current affairs. The events may differ, but the fundamentals remain identical. Interest, passions, language, episodes, everything looks the same. The people of that time have come back to life today. Based on the experience of the 1848 revolution, where absolute monarchies were toppled across Europe and France established its second republic, but it was all for naught. All it ended up being defeated. Monarchies came back. Radical promises were betrayed. Blanqui concluded that the modern Jacobins, who had so who had proclaimed the, that republic, had stood against the people and in the camp of the counter-revolution. And he said, "Our own self-styled Jacobins are a caricature. We need a very poor copy of the Girondins. The Girondins being the moderate party of the French Revolution, unwilling to defend it against external adversaries and the internal counter-revolution." In other words, the heirs of Jacobism could not live up to the Enlightenment and revolutionary principles of their namesake. They have adopted, Blanqui said, it is true, the motto and the banner of the former mountain. They only swear by Robespierre and the Jacobins, but in this they have no choice. How would deception be possible without it? It is the common ruse of schemers to wave the flag of the people. How true then? and truth to it. Blanqui believed that history had now passed by the Jacobins and the bourgeoisie. He said, now science has forged more certain weapons for the people. It has cleared for us a more, a wider and more direct way. The more certain weapons that he identified was provided by socialism. As he said, citizens, the mountain is dead. Long live socialism, it's true air. And in an 1852 letter to another exile, his identification of the revolution and socialism in place of Jacobism was made very explicit. You are a revolutionary socialist. One cannot be a revolutionary without being a socialist and vice versa." End quote. His allegiance to socialism did not alter Blanqui's belief that the promises and slogans of 1789 must be fulfilled. He stated that socialism could only be realized by building on the foundations of the French Revolution. He said, liberty, equality, fraternity, and that admirable symbol, the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, which broadly interpreted contains the seeds of all development of future society. To actualize the Jacobins' Enlightenment ideals meant bourgeois society itself had to be overcome. When Blanqui uttered the sacred words republic, he did not mean Robespierre's republic of virtue, composed of small property owners, but a revolutionary rupture with the whole existing society. The Republic, he said, means the emancipation of workers. It is the end of the reign of exploitation. It is the coming of the new order that will free labor from the tyranny of capital. In other words, socialism not only defended Enlightenment ideals more consistently than Jacobism, but in the end, it was the only way to realize them. In taking Enlightenment rationalism to its logical conclusion, Blanqui was a stalwart atheist and materialist. For Blanqui, materialism or naturalism restores man's dignity, activity, and independence. While religion served the wealthy classes, materialism served the masses in their struggle against the bourgeoisie. By this logic, materialism had given birth to science and human initiative, while religion and spirituality brought forth superstition, ignorance, and fatalism. This meant that religion was the natural ally and bulwark of the state and the ruling class, since it kept the people ignorant. At one point, Blanqui said, religion is the means of government, a protector of privilege against the multitude. The proletariat should distrust any emblem which does not bear in bold letters the motto, atheism and materialism. In Blanqui, every assault on religion, whether from materialism, atheism, or secular education, was to be celebrated, since they challenged and furthered the revolutionary cause.
Now, in accordance with his rationalist philosophy, Blanqui did believe in progress. He thought that history was moving in the direction of communism, which could be measured by the advance of association and cooperation over individualism. He viewed individualism as antithetical to the interests of society, since the main motivation for social development came at the expense of others. In a society founded on individualism, others with individualistic drives would frustrate social advance and reduce people to the state of animals. By contrast, association would protect the weak, encourage solidarity, and prevent the mutual self-destruction inherent in individualism. And the final triumph of association to him was communism, which he considered synonymous with the Enlightenment. And again, he says, communism will only be achieved through the absolute triumph of the Enlightenment. It will be its, its final consequence, its social and political expression. His defense of the Enlightenment differed from positivists, such as August Comte, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, who divorced science from the Enlightenment, materialism, and revolution. In this theory, very similar to the new atheists, according to him, the positivists used progress to legitimize the ruling class and its crime. And, what it, and he says, what a terrible strength this is for the fatalists of history, worshippers of the accomplished fact. All the atrocities of the victors, their long series of attacks, are coldly transformed into a regular and inevitable evolution like that of nature. All of this is legitimate, essential. It must be seen as mankind's natural, necessary course. If the course, if the rule of the bourgeoisie was in line with progress, then the wretched of the earth should accept their fate. But Blanqui rejected any a fatalistic conception of progress because it condemned workers to slavery and ignorance. For Blanqui, progress was not measured, assured because humanity could either advance or it could regress. And he said, I am not amongst those who claim that progress can be taken for granted, that humanity cannot go backward. No, there is no fatality, otherwise the history of humanity, which is written by the Isle, would entirely be written in advance. Ultimately, the excessive progress depended upon revolution. And the revolution, to him, could not come from the people liberating themselves because the state and church kept them ignorant. Rather, the triumph of the revolution hinged upon an enlightened belief. Who took up arms to overthrow the old order to block the rule of progress? Arms and organization, he said, these are the decisive elements of progress, the serious method for putting an end to misery. Who has iron has bread. After the revolution, the conspirators were governed on behalf of the people until they were enlightened enough to rule on their own. Now this gets into a bit of inside baseball, but necessary. And Blanqui's enlightenment, uh, advocacy of the Enlightenment progress runs up against a very common uh, reading of his work, his astronomical work, Eternity by the Stars, written in 1872, encouraged by the radical German critic, Walter Benjamin. Benjamin believed that this work, reject, uh, of Blanqui's work, rejected both progress and the Enlightenment. Furthermore, Benjamin argued that there were affinities between Blanqui's work and those of the uh, of some apolitical poets and the anti-Enlightenment philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. If Blanc Benjamin is correct, then we have to move Blanqui from the Enlightenment tradition and place him among it, the Romantics. And the basic argument of Eternity by the Stars, which is a very fun book to read, is that the universe is infinite in both time and space. He claims that there are only a, a limited uh, set of elements, and because the combination of these elements was finite, resorting to repetition becomes inevitable and necessary. Based on these assumptions, which are, are actually scientifically groundless, he speculated on the existence of multiple worlds where every person event uh, is repeated. This leads Blanqui to clear and despair that, and I quote, so many identical populations come to pass without having suspected each other's existence. Moreover, so far the past represented barbarity, the future meant progress, science, happiness, and illusion. This past has witnessed the disappearance of the most brilliant civilization on every one of our globe levels. They disappeared without leaving a trace, and they will do so again without leaving more of a trace. What we call progress is locked up on each earth and disappears with it." End quote. Benjamin noted the similarity between Blanqui's multiverse theory and Nietzsche's idea of the eternal return in rejecting progress. 
According to Benjamin, Blanqui heaps scorn on the idea of progress. One should not necessarily conclude from this that he was untrue to his political credo. The activities of professional conspirator like Blanqui certainly do not pre presuppose any belief in progress. They merely presuppose a determination to do away with present injustice. Benjamin goes further and states that Blanqui's worldview is a vision of hell, an admission of failure for the revolutionary project. And I quote, the complement of that society which Blanqui near the end of his life was forced to admit had defeated him. This resignation without hope is the last word of the great revolutionary. Now Benjamin's contention that eternity by the stars rejects the idea of progress is open to dispute. For one, Blanqui's work hastened to hold the door open for hope and action despite everything. As he says, for tomorrow, the events and the people will follow their course. For now on, only the unknown is before us. Like the earth past, the future will change direction a million times. A future shall come to an end only when the globe dies. Only then every second will bring its new uh, verification, the road taken and the road that could have been taken. In other words, our own choices mean progress and action are still possible for the future. And he says further, they are luckier than us. All the beautiful things that our world will see, our future descendants have already seen, are seeing them right now, and will see them always, of course, in the form of doubles that preceded them and will follow them. As sons of a better humanity, they have already prop properly uh, humiliated and defamed us on the dead earths and passing there after us. They continue to denigrate us on the living earths from which we have disappeared, and they will forever continue to hunt us with their scorn of Earths yet to be born." Unquote. Eternity by the stars view of progress is perfectly aligned with Blanqui's general philosophy and his voluntaristic conception of progress. While the objective conditions are overwhelmingly stacked against revolutionaries, this does not mean that there is no space to be created for action. Rather, the revolutionary effort, the will to fight and win against the odds, can unveil unforeseen roads to the future. These roads are not given to anyone in advance, but are revealed in the course of struggle. Secondly, the historian Ian Birchall says that eternity by the stars was not Blanqui's final word or surrender. Birchall argues that Blanqui wrote the book in 1872 to cheer him up in very hard times. Following the defeat of the Great Paris Commune, where tens of thousands of workers and revolutionaries were massacred. After writing Eternity by the Stars, Blanqui lived for another decade. And after his release from prison in 1879, he worked for Amnesty for the Communards. He traveled and spoke across France, and he started a newspaper with the famous slogan, No God, No Master. As Birchall notes, if ever revolutionary fought till the last breath, it was Blanqui. And the connection that, uh, any connection between Blanqui and Nietzsche is equally non-existent. There is no evidence that Nietzsche's concept of eternal return was influenced by Blanqui's work. In fact, Nietzsche was an aristocratic rebel who detested democracy and socialism. And Blanqui's final speech was a defense of the red flag and socialist revolution it represented. It. Based on this, we can say that Benjamin's interpretation of Blanqui is fatally flawed. And this brings us to the period after Blanqui's death in 1881. His politics largely died out, but his revolutionary spirit remained to haunt and torment many in the new Marxist-oriented socialist parties then emerging across Europe. The German socialist Edward Bernstein argued in his 1898 work, Evolutionary Socialism, that Marxism needed to be updated and revised by removing its revolutionary elements to make it a movement for social reform. Bernstein believed Marx and Engels' youthful works must be purged of the twofold influence of Hegel and Blanqui. It was no accident that Bernstein linked these two names. He saw Hegel and Blanqui sharing a common rationalism which leads to radical extremism. When Marx applied the Hegelian dialectic to the material world, it had revolutionary implications. Bernstein says, Every time we see the doctrine which proceeds from the economy as the basis of historical de development capitulate before the theory which stretches the cult of force to its limits, we find a Hegelian principle. It does not contradict itself because on its own account, everything carries its contradictions within itself. Is it a contradiction to put force in the place so recently occupied by the economy? 
and according to Bernstein, the Hegelian dialectic naturally resulted in Blancism, which was a theory of the immeasurable creative power of revolutionary political force and its manifestation of revolutionary exp expropriation and could be found in the Communist Manifesto. Bernstein concluded that the great things of Marx and Engels achieved were achieved not because of the Hegelian dialectic, but in spite of it. When, on the other hand, they passed over the greatest errors of Blancism, it was primarily the Hegelian element in the theory that is to blame. And many took objection to this. Rosa Luxemburg, the great Polish revolutionary, argued that Bernstein could only accuse Marx and Engels of Blancism by twisting the word beyond recognition that it meant any revolutionary action. And Luxembourg said Bernstein thundering against the conquest of political power as a theory of Blancus violence has the misfortune of labeling as Blanc a Blancus error, that which has always been the pivot and motive force of human history. From the first appearance of class society, having the class struggle as the essential element of history, the conquest of political power has been the aim of all rising classes. Bernstein did not judge the Enlightenment, though merely its revolutionary conclusions. In the place of Hegel, Blanqui, and materialism, he substituted Immanuel Kant, and with his emphasis on moral imperatives and their ev evolutionary implications. And Bernstein represents a moderate criticism of Blanqui. His revisionist attacks on Blanqui's elements of Marxism was simply a shield for his true target, any and all advocacy of revolution. And this brings us to George Sorrell, and Benito Mussolini, who may seem very far from Blanca, but did actually have quite a bit to say. George Searle was a famous French philosopher, a syndicalist theorist, and he's most famous for his work, The Reflections of Violence. But in an earlier work, The Decomposition of Marxism, written in 18, 1908, Sorrell agreed with Bernstein's conclusion that the Hegelian dialectic led to Blancism. In contrast to Bernstein, Sorrell did not wish to formulate a philosophy of reformism, but returned Marxism to its original revolutionary mission. And in Reflections on Violence, he elaborated on this new conception of Marxism. He rejected enlightened rationalist philosophy as a tool of the bourgeoisie. The idea of progress was condemned for being fatalistic and deterministic. Of course, overall, revolutionary action was no longer based on material necessity or revolutionary science, but originated in motion and intuition located in myths. Myths, according to uh, Sorrell, were superior in mobilizing the masses because they could not be refuted by the tools of science and reason. For Sorrell, myths were at bottom identical with the convictions of the group being the expression of these convictions in the language of movement that is, in consequence, unanalyzable parts into parts which could be placed under the plane of historical description. Myths were not a description of things but an expression of will and collections of images which taken together and through intuition alone before any considered analyses are made are capable of evoking the mass of sentiments which correspond to the different manifestations of war undertaken by socialism against modern society. Bergson and the politics of the will had to the given place of Monkey and the Enlightenment and Sorel's quote unquote Marxism. Sorelian myths were so empty of content that they could be easily exploited by reactionaries. This was the case with the Italian socialist turned fascist Benito Mussolini. For supporting Italian involvement in the First World War, Mussolini was expelled from the Socialist Party and turned to Blanqui. Despite his pro-war stance, Mussolini still considered himself a socialist and champion Blanqui, who he believed represented a genuine synthesis between socialism and nationalism. And the masthead of Mussolini's paper bore Blanqui's slogan, he who has iron has bread. Blanqui would be many of the symbols and myths, such as heroism, vitalism, and national rebirth, adopted by Mussolini and fascism in their counter-revolutionary crusade. In 1921, as the black church murdered socialists across Italy, Mussolini gave a fiery speech in the Italian Chamber of Deputies, where he claimed to have introduced into Italian socialism something of Bergson mixed with much of Blanqui. And the Italian communist leader, Antonio Gramsci, noted, Mussolini took all superficial elements of Blancism, or rather he made himself into something superficial, reducing it to 
to the materiality of the dominant minority in the use of arms in a violent attack. Only by severing Blanqui's linkage to the Enlightenment and Communism could Mussolini utilize him as an empty myth and turn him into a mindless man of action. Opposed to Mussolini were Blanqui's true philosophical and revolutionary heirs among the communist deputies, who promised to fulfill the promises of the Enlightenment. Mussolini condemned them in that same speech for championing the dictatorship of the proletariat, of Soviets and other absurdities. Correctly, Mussolini understood that between the two worldviews of communism and fascism, that compromise was impossible, and he said, there can only be combat between us. Communists stood for the revolution and the radical enlightenment, while fascists were counter-revolutionaries who stood for the destruction of reason. Mussolini's appropriation of Blanqui betrayed the complete meaning of his life's work. And to finish, it is true that Blanqui's enlightenment worldview is ne neither consistent nor systematic. His defense of universalism is marred by vitriolic French nationalism and volunteerism. But what does this mean for today with the Enlightenment under threat from the forces of reaction and abandoned by its false friends? There's a choice of two worldviews involved. We can choose to either consistently develop the universalist elements of Blanqui's philosophy and recognize that the principle of reason, egalitarianism, and universalism are incompatible with offensive capitalism and inequality. That means that understanding that communism can re only can realize the unfulfilled promises of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment, or we can abandon them. Many contemporary re leftists have rejected the Enlightenment and chosen a right-wing epistemology coupled with left eth ethics, ultimately placing themselves on the same philosophical side as Edmund Burke, the Vatican, the Islamic Republic of Iran, or fascism. There is a choice between right and wrong answers a right philosophy and a wrong one. Radical enlightenment or reaction, or as Rosa Luxemburg said, socialism or barbarism. So I guess we can take uh, questions, comments, concerns. I'm sorry if, if uh, my sound was not projecting quite as well. I'm normally used to having a podium, but this is a restaurant. So I'm happy to take questions. Oh, yes, certainly. So feel free. Again, the books will be on sale afterwards. Ten bucks. Autograph included in the price. All the ideas you've talked about seem to have come after 1800, um, where the American Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are all said to have been products of the Enlightenment. What do you, how do you think these influenced the American experience, uh, the Civil War, and some other things? That's, that's a good question. Well, as far as we, I would actually argue that the, uh, in contrast to say the French Revolution, that the American Revolution represents uh, what uh, Fluss and Frim would call the modern enlightenment. It's true that if you read the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, there's some very great universalist sounding principles in there, including in the Constitution as well. But we have to understand that this is a country founded upon the genocide of the indigenous population and the enslavement of millions of people. It's very clear that all men were not created equal according to the slaveholders who wrote that constitution. Now there were, I would argue, universal elements, a radical enlightenment critique we could say identify with say someone like Thomas Paine, who was also a, a major participant in the French Revolution and helped give birth to radical, the radical English class working with him. I think if we're actually to look at sort of the radicalism and the enlightenment played out in the American experience. I looked at the Civil War and radical reconstruction. Suddenly, uh, the slave system that uh, met, they kept four million people in bondage was destroyed. And throughout the South, during a period of 12 years in the reconstruction period, we have former slaves in, uh, running governments throughout the South. And it's not just to benefit them, obviously, the education, the new social programs done and the new political rights benefit them, but they also benefited poor whites, too. That, in a certain sense, is the fulfillment of those promises. And there was a certain fear, in fact, that the radical reconstruction was linked to things like the Paris Commune and uh, revolutionary currents coming out of Europe, and I don't think that's an accident. I think it, because those currents were universal, they were they represented a chance to overcome these in inherited inequalities. So in a certain sense, the radical reconstruction, the Civil War, 
is a true revolutionary experience involving masses of formally oppressed peoples truly asserting their rights and trying to create a universal system. A great book on this is uh, W. B. Du Bois, uh, Black Reconstruction. A wonderful book written in the 30s. Uh, that uh, was ignored at the time, but it's uh, since actually become quite a classic. That's what I would say about that. And I, I'd actually argue that if there's any value in any US traditions, and I do not consider myself in any respect an American patriot, is that it, it requires rupturing with the, the current uh, socioeconomic order and its political system. A system that can produce a Donald Trump or a Hillary Clinton is not a system worth defending, it's a system worth destroying. Yeah, in the back. Actually, I'm sorry, do you need this? I can hear you, but if you don't... Probably. Um, at the beginning when you talked about the three pillars of the Enlightenment, yes. um, on the issue of progress, it was unclear um, whether you were saying the thinking was that Enlightenment was, or progress was inevitable, or that it was just possible. That depends on which Enlightenment thinker we talk about, but there, I'm basing my that interpretation on uh, some work by Neil Davidson, along with uh, my friends Harrison Fluss and Landon Frimp. But that progress, as opposed to current, uh, more other theories that it said, uh, we are generally living in a, a world marked by sin, stagnation, regression. So you can see people like uh, the Italian philosopher, I believe, Vico, who actually su suggests that progress is possible. And again, there's a variations on different Enlightenment thinkers who think that it's inevitable or possible, and you know, we could go into that. But I think partly the Enlightenment does give the belief, firstly, that progress is possible, and depending on who you, which Enlightenment thinker you're talking about, that's inevitable. Well, Vico saw history as cyclical. Um, so I guess, I guess uh, it's interesting to me because, look, especially later in the book, we talk about Lockheed's uh, idea that you mentioned that there's nothing inevitable about progress. It's up to the people what happens. But I got to thinking if the idea, this, this pillar of enlightenment is that uh, progress is a teleological kind of thing, it's inevitable, um, that would, that would make him, if that was the dominant view, that would make him kind of out of stuff with that aspect of the enlightenment vision, which is, is fine, but it would, it would just mean that he was different in that respect, it's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, first of all, Blanqui was also, even though he is very much an elitist, he was putting a very great emphasis on political action to achieve progress. And even in Marx, there's no guarantee of the inevitability of progress. Right in the very opening words of the Communist Manifesto, the struggle, these various class struggles between slaves and masters, between serfs and lords, or workers in the bourgeoisie, either results in a new higher form of society or the common ruin of contending cla classes. So in a certain sense, Marx would agree with Blanqui that it does require a certain organization of people, a certain amount of political will, depending on, at least for Marx, objective conditions to advance progress. Well, can I ask a related question? Sure. I was unclear when you used the word materialist in here. Um, if you, concerning Blocky. If you're talking about materialism in a Marxian sense, or if it's a synonym for nationalism. Not nationalism. In fact, not even a... Naturalism. Oh, naturalism. Yeah. Probably more naturalism. He has no sense of dialectics at all. So he, he we, if, some, if anyone ever described Blanqui as some kind of dialectic materialist, they're wrong. There's no evidence whatsoever he had any familiarity with that. He's more, in, uh, I get you, one second. More, he's probably more in line with the more mechanical materialists of the 18th centuries. 
as opposed to any form of Marxian materialism. Well, I was going to sort of ask that question of how did he relate to Marx's people's as life was when they sort of left? Did they communicate? Mm -hmm. Did he find himself in opposition in any way? That, that's a great question. First of all, they never met in any capacity. And it's true that Marx dies about two years after Blanqui. And as far as what we can say is, uh, actually, Marx's, one of Marx's son-in-law, Paul Lafarge, who was a French medical student, was in the Blanquist movement in the 1860s, and did share some of Marx's works with Blanqui, notably the Poverty Philosophy, which is an attack on the uh, anarchist theoretician Perdon, which Blanqui supposedly liked because he didn't like Perdon. Uh, and we don't know how much uh, uh, Lafarge was kind of playing with Marx, by saying Blanqui has the greatest esteem for you, Lafarge was known to exaggerate in many of his letters. What we do know is that Marx and Engels, they knew about Blanqui, they write about him. They have no use for his method of revolution. They call Blanqui's conspiracy the alchemists of revolution. There's a long quote somewhere in the appendix of my book about that. They had the highest esteem for him as a person, absolutely the highest. They said of him, Blanqui is the head and the heart of the proletarian movement in France. And they did actually, they were part of campaigns for his release. And they worked with some of Blanqui's supporters. And at one point, and there's a question about how accurate this is, but supposedly Marx at one point wanted Blanqui to head the new French Socialist Party. Blanqui did not want to do that. But they never worked together. They did, in certain respects, take similar stands. So, Blanqui, of course, opposed in, say, 1848, the June Massacre, where the French government massacred tens of thousands of workers, which Marx is, of course, opposed, and he did want a radical republic, uh, a social republic, modeled on the Jacobins in, in France that year. Marx's thinking, actually, was very similar to that. And, in fact, during the Paris Commune, Karl Marx said that Blanqui was in prison during the whole of the Commune. He said that if Blanqui was there, it would have been worth the whole army corps. It would have been giving the commune a leader. And they recognized, similar to Blanqui's followers who were leaderless in the commune, that vi vigorous military action was absolutely necessary by the commune. You know, actual decisive leadership. And they identified Blanqui as that figure. Now, I don't want to say that Marx and Engels were Blanquis. Again, they were not. What I will say is that in certain conceptions of Marx and Engels, we, of their idea of party organization. They understood the need for its political, independent political action by workers, of, of exercising a revolutionary dictatorship, and of, they were similar, they were influenced by the, Jack, the same Jacobin model as Blanqui, but there's of course certain differentiations important to keep in mind. They were, they did not actually particularly like Robespierre, Marx and Engels, and they were, more concerned with organizing the working class. They did, and they of course favored whenever possible open agitation amongst them. And they did not want a minority dictatorship that Blanqui did. They wanted a, or, the dictatorship of the proletariat of Marxist parlance means the dictatorship of the working class as a class. In other words, the, a real democracy by the vast majority of people of the exploited classes. Where Blanqui, the dictatorship, and he never uses the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat, just means our organization is in control. Uh, if that didn't answer, okay. Comments, concerns, objections, polemics? This phrase of yours, the radiant future? What about it? Is that yours, or did you get it somewhere else? What? what I, I, hold on. Can you just pass Page 109? I don't actually remember. I did write it, but I don't remember everything. <laughs> I'm just wondering, if, is that a, a greenism, or are you quoting something I should I should know about? Or no, I got to figure out. Where, where is it on this page? Can you show me? I'm sorry. Uh, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not sure. 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 I'm not s
to realize the reason Okay, that's actually me. Okay. Because yeah. I might want to quote that at some oh, yeah. point. Okay, you just want to know if I... I would still say this, that there's not a footnote at the end of that sentence, it's, 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 one, it's me. I wrote that myself. I'm probably not the first person to ever say radiant future. Yes, yes you are. <laughs> if I am, I'm quite sure. She's she in light of what you've just told us. I'm sorry, what? In light of what you've just you described, my, my, my the view from where I sit about my current culture is that we have gone backwards. And we could almost be mid-1800s looking forward as to what we need to address. I mean, I feel like, I feel like we're completely not any communal collectivist future is grab for individualism and for remnants. Mm -hmm. So this narrative that you just raised is like, yeah, it is quite disturbing, and like I said, there's progression to a higher form of society or falling backwards, and it does, I would, I mean, I agree with that, you know, things do not look that great now, you know. Not that great, and it really depends on us what we're willing to do and what we're able to do. It's, things do not change on their own as much as we may want it to. Yes? I've actually thought for a while that there's a lot of reason to believe that things are looking very different. When you consider, like, there are still, we're, we're still feeling the vibrations of, of Occupy Wall Street. And you can lock down the Black Lives Matter. And then, you know, I know, I, know, I, I understand some people have that, that big fans of Bernie. You know, the guy is Bernie, and I know he had a lot of people. And, and the, 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 the election of Trump. So it's, it's like there are, there are groups all over these countries that I think a lot of liberals as well who are actually waking up. You know, I think that there's a couple that are actually radicalizing the company of people. And in some ways, when we get a Republican president, all of a sudden, you know, the, the liberals are against her again. <laughs> they were supposedly against Bush, too, but they didn't really have much of a problem when Obama launched those drone strikes. But what happens is when you have a Republican in office, then uh, the liberals are actually they're a little bit more supportive of the actual laws. I, I get your point, and I'm, I'm not going to, as a participant in the Occupy movement, it was certainly a very inspiring event, and we certainly do see its continuing ripples and echoes throughout society. And I think the Black Lives Matter is very inspiring. I am not really convinced about the Bernie Sanders movement. I think he's actually, I, I mean, I don't think a defense of imperialism or apartheid Israel is something that should ever be defended, which is what he does. And I think we have to be careful of uh, yeah, and I mean, I was at the big protests in Boston uh, after, right after Trump was inaugurated, where you have several hundred thousand people there. That's great. The question is, you know, where are you going to go with that? If it ends up going into another election campaign in 2018 or 20 to get just some moderately less disgusting Democrats elected, then it's really not that great. Then it just continues what we have now. Unless you're willing to start contemplating a different type of society and not get involved in this election game, then I think we have to, that that's what we need to do. I'm for less voting and more revolution. I think that's what we need. What does that look like to individuals such as you or anybody else that you're encouraged to do that? What does that look like? Now, as a fairly orthodox, in certain sense, a Bolshevik Leninist, I do think having independent political expression for the exploited class is important. I know, but how do you, you do that? How do you do that? Do you give them a platform? I mean, we. You, as an individual. You, me as an individual, I mean, I think it does start with talking about different ideas, different alternative societies, and not being restricted to the current frameworks that uh, 
exist. That can, you know, it can be done in small circles like now, it can be done on the streets. I do think it needs to move beyond study circles to organize political expression. It's not easy. And most of the time, like, these efforts have failed, and sometimes quite miserably, but I think it can succeed and it has in the past. I know that's quite vague, but, you know, that's, that's where I'm coming from. No, it's just, yes. I'll start again. Okay. In your book on Blanke, you had a whole discussion about the Blancas and the free thought movement in France, how they organized things like secular funerals. They had like a, a secular burial society, so people didn't have to people didn't have to use the church. And I guess they organized other kinds of uh, secular ceremonies to replace those from the uh, traditional religion. So they had no thinking about it. The question dealt with um, the various uh, anti-theistic or atheist aspects of the Blancas movements during the reign of Napoleon III. And basically, this was done by the Blancas movement as a way to reach a wider audience, which they normally didn't do. They normally just spent their time training and preparing to get in the streets and take up guns. Basically, in a society like France in the 19th century, church and state were one. A, a challenge to the existing religion was not just a religious challenge, it was a political challenge. So if you suddenly you're spreading atheist tracts or humanist tracts, you were saying, not only are, do we not believe in the dictates of the Catholic Church and, and organized religion, but this government is not sanctioned by God, it is not divine, it is not holy, and it's a way it's basically a, the question, the criticism of religion becomes a gateway to the criticism of politics. It was a done very deliberate. If you disrupting a state-sponsored um, discussion on religion by suddenly talking about why you know the, the absurdities of the church and there are quite many, um, it's a political challenge, and that's what they did. They were helping. A lot of working class people did not like the Catholic Church, with good reason, because the French Catholic Church sided with every reactionary in France throughout the 19th and 18th centuries. They tried to overthrow the two republics France had had up to that point. So a lot of working class people who were very secular, who were influenced by Jacobinism and various forms of socialism, did not want to be buried in a Catholic uh, plot. So they organized their own burial societies, and the Bonacus helped with that. They didn't want to gather in church spaces, so the Blancas helped them. One of them actually owned a tavern, I believe, or a wine shop. And they would just gather there to talk about things. And it was a way both to criticize religion and create an opposition space, and to build their own support. And it's quite interesting to do. And this was, uh, this is incidentally, kind of something Marx recognized earlier in Germany. And Marx, uh, in one of his introduction to Hegel's philosophy of writer, one of those said, the criticism of religion leads to the criticism of politics and the state. Because that's a lot, way a lot of this, the uh, early young Hegelians started. They started talking about why Jesus wasn't a god. And that was seen as a political challenge in a society where church and state are one. That's kind of how that went. And the same would happen in, in any country where church and state are one. If you are either a different religion or you are an atheist, it's a political challenge as much as a religious one. So that would be the case in, say, Saudi Arabia right now, if you're an atheist. Or if you're an atheist, or even a communist, of course, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. That idea of the anti-religious being uh, anti-political or concerned with politics is totally Marxist. Yep. Totally Marxist. Idea. I mean, we're also dealing with a different conception of, of atheism at this point than I think we might be used to in our contemporary reality. A lot of these early atheists, uh, one of my favorites is a French priest, who's also an atheist named Jean Messler, writing in the 18th century. And his last testament is just this hatred of the Catholic Church, hatred of all religions, 
but also a hatred of monarchy, of private property, of the oppression of women. They saw it very much tied into atheism. You know, the promotion of science was also done by the anarchists. Anarchists took up Blanqui's slogan, no God, no master. Early Marxist mo movements as well. If you were an atheist back then, you were in some fashion on the left. Granted, there were bourgeois anti-clericalism as well. Nowadays, you know, you have um, what I call imperial atheists like Christopher Hitchens or Sam Harris who think that atheism is perfectly compatible with the Iraq war and the torture of terrorism suspects. Well, that's no atheism I recognize, and I'll take a religious person at my side any day than I will a new imperial atheist. You know I agree with all that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments, concerns, discussion? I realize the talk may not have been heard quite well, but we can talk about issues. I have a question. Um, sure. I'm curious about the, the historiographical reason for the book. I take it there was not prior to you. A, uh, you know, reader friendly, fairly short introduction to the life and no. work of this man, and that's why you did it. Partly. You don't, you don't say why. You know. I. You want to know why I decided to write it? Is that? Well, I, I'm, interested, I'm interested in the historiographical. Um, how this fits historiographically. Okay. You know, the last major writing on Blanqui, uh, biography-wise in English, was in 1971. Uh, it's a book I quote a bu bunch in mind because it's a really good one, called Blanqui and August Blanqui and the Art of Insurrection by Samuel Bernstein. And I believe uh, he was a Marxist. He's associated with the Journal of Science and Society. He was. Uh, I do recommend that. So basically, I was filling in some gaps. I was coming at that basically. There, were, there have been some new sources released since then. Walter Benjamin, however critical I was in that section, his Arcades project is a really interesting source with all kinds of elements dealing with French, French society in the 19th century. And that's one thing that actually got me interested in Blanc as a person. And there are actually other researchers who have been translating a lot of Blanc's writings into English for the first time. I mentioned in there there's an archive in Kingston University over in the United Kingdom. They're released, they're putting some of his works into English for the very first time and gathering up archives. So it was actually very, e you know, now it's actually fairly easy to get sources I was looking for. And I also kind of wanted to give, and this is not so much, uh, and the, even the, there's not too much even in French, you know. The last major French biography was, I believe, in 1976, and I don't even think that was by a Marxist. And most biographies of Blanqui are by some variant of Marxist or another. There's only really two in English. Um, my concern was to do something that's not a dismissal of Blanqui, which is how most people, including leftists of whatever sort, treat him. And not to do something where uh, some People, including people I, I particularly like, like Peter Howard, who want to assimilate Blanqui to Marxism, which I, I don't do. Yeah, I don't think you. If your footnote, if your uh, bookmark is correct, you haven't got to the appendix yet, where I kind of go into that. Yeah, I made, I made it uh, to 128. Okay, so, so you're not quite there. But uh, there's some who are like, well, Blanqui corrects Marxist determinism. Well, no, Blanqui does not correct Marxist determinism. There's really, theoretically, that there's not much overlap. Like, some French writers have tried to claim and do that, that they're wrong, but there are interesting places where they work in parallel, certain questions Blanqui raises that are first raised by later Marxists, you know, not just Marx and Engels, but people like Lenin, Trotsky, etc. Anything else? One last thing. When you started out, you were saying that Blanqui believed in uh, the, the class struggle and that there were basically two classes in history, more or less you know, yeah, yeah, that way at the moment. Was, did he precede Marx and Engels in that? Was that a common set of beliefs that was already in the air when Marx and Engels That's a common set of beliefs uh, by that point. First of all, 
if you were a silk worker in Lyon in 1832, you're kind of going to see very clearly that you live very differently than your, your, the boss at your factory. And Marx and Engels actually do say in one of their letters, I believe in 1851, no credit should be given to me for coming up with the existence of classes. That was done by bourgeois historians before them. So a lot of like early historiography in say the 19th century, especially influenced by the French Revolution, is it recognizing there's class struggle going on. And a good book that goes into this, if you want to read it, is uh, How Revolutionary Were the Bourgeois Revolution by Neil Davidson. It's a huge, long book, but there's some really great discussion on how that this understanding of class and class struggle. Blanqui is really kind of just articulating it in his own way, and his, if you actually really get into it, it's quite superficial. He thinks most people in France are, are proletarians, which is not true. And it, he thinks it's something like 90%. But we should always be careful about us looking at Blanqui for some kind of really developed systematic theory, which he does not have. He's not a theoretician. This is not someone you go to like you go to Marx, Lenin, or Mao, or any of them who do have very systematic theories to understand the world. Blanqui does not do that. And by design, he does not do that. So we should always, but you're right, he does recognize that there's this basic class struggle, but it's, it's very crudely drawn. It's not really, good. he doesn't go to archives to research it or anything like that. We should not pretend that he would. Can I follow it up? Sure. Uh, would you fault him then for pioneering this man of action theory that was so easily co-opted by fascism and or others because he did not go into theory enough in the sense of creating a space for thinking as opposed to just doing it? No, I would uh, Basically, that stuff happened after his death, and I think it's, it's a, basically he, like there's some, some really dogmatic Marxists I've dealt with who, well, he didn't adopt this and that of Marxist theory. Of course he didn't adopt it. You know, he was already politically formed by he, the time he's 35, largely. Marx and are not writing it by the time Blanqui's 35. There's no way he's interacting with it. He has no knowledge of it. I actually think it, he's trying to make sense in a society that's rapidly industrializing. There's this new class coming into being. He's also dealing with still the impact of the French Revolution, the fact that they're still fighting feudalist religion, and he's dealing with, as Mao would say, a hundred schools of thought to comprehend that. You have liberals, you have conservatives, you have utopian socialists, Jacobin socialists, you have bourgeois republicans, and, they're, and he's trying to figure that out. I think it's actually, I would look at him as a transitional figure. By the time the type of independent working class politics that come to predominate in Europe by the end of the 19th and the 20th centuries are only coming into being when he dies. I'm not going to fault him for not anticipating that because he didn't want to anticipate that. He had a very specific agenda which was revolution by coup d'etat. What people do uh, to co-op and like I think it is important to recognize there are contradictions in his thought. He could be very vitriolic French nationalist. Some of the stuff he says during the Franco-Prussian War is really gross. It was taken up by the French government in World War I and reprinted. And not something I'd be proud of. And used against actually more internationalist socialists. Uh, those contradictions exist. And again, he was a bundle of thoughts, not a systematic theorist. Which is why I think you know, if you're going to uphold them, don't up, you can't, anyone who, who wants to just uphold them, like, uncritically, that's not a good approach to take, it's kind of wrong. Look at those elements of his that I think that we could universalize. I think the defense of the Enlightenment is one. I think the questions he asked about how to make revolution are other ones. But if we're to blame Blanqui for how he's misappropriated after he dies, I mean, I don't particularly like the Communist Party of China, but they have uh, they they claim Karl Marx, they claim Lenin. I don't think that's an appropriate lineage, but that's what they do. And you're not going to be in control of how people appropriate you after you die. 
No, but, but I, I was just getting to the point sure. of, by example, you, you don't need to develop a systematic body of thought to be a leader. That's true. That, that aspect of his example can be a dangerous thing. Even in his life, he couldn't recognize that. If he had done it self critical I'm not saying that he wasn't and that he did it. You're right. You know, you don't have to be a leader with some kind of systematic, uh, red, uh, systematic philosophy or politics. That's true. There are plenty of people we can name, but I think it's actually a good thing to do that. I, as I hope I made clear, I think a revolutionary politics requires a revolutionary philosophy to understand and know the world so we can understand how to change it. And Blanqui can provide some building blocks for that. I think the defense of the Enlightenment is important. I think defending it, you know, it's a radical kernel against whether reactionaries, whether the liberals or the postmodernists is important. I'm just thinking out loud here, but it seems like for somebody who is so conscious of the Enlightenment and his, his part of being a product of it, somebody who would say he admires the core ideas of the Enlightenment, finds it a very great change in the direction of humanity, would would recognize the need to, if he's going to uh, emphasize action the way he did, that he would see a need, feel a need to develop a, some kind of possibly systematic theory of practice. You know what I mean? That seems like the sort of thing like a contradiction to say, I celebrate the Enlightenment, you know, our revolution is a product of the Enlightenment, of all our efforts and all that, but, but yet not want to justify, explain in some detail, make some kind of um, good art for why action is so, action in the, in the sense that he was emphasizing it relative to theory, right, you know, what, why this is a good approach. Maybe I'm not explaining my I mean, why he didn't want to popularize, say, Enlightenment ideas? Is that for the end? I mean, why someone who's, identified with the Enlightenment, sees himself as, and his movements, as a product of Enlightenment changes, Enlightenment thinking, wouldn't see a need, at minimum, to, to, to try and build a theory of praxis by which, I mean, it has different definitions, but I'm using it in the sense of emphasizing um, action over theory, which seems to be very much what he was about. But why you, why he wouldn't see a need to come up with some kind of you know, philosophical? Because that wasn't what his priority was. Just like, and this would apply as much if he did it with the utopian socialists, and I think it would apply to this. He does not want to spend his time doing theoretical speculations or imagining the future or even really writing some philosophical justification or systematic theory. As far as he's concerned, the, the current world is so oppressive and so unjust and so exploited that the most important thing you need to do is plan and organize to destroy it. That was his, and he thought, this has already been figured out, as he said, the philosophy of the 18th century. That's before he's born. It's already figured out. All you need to do is just pick it up, get your rifle, <laughs> organize with your comrades, and that's what you gotta do. You don't wanna spend your time like uh, Charles Foyer or Robert Owen or the Utopians did, imagining these great societies. And he actually said, when we get to the, the important thing with us is not to 
imagine a society. When we cross the river, then we can decide it. Then we can figure out how it's run. The important thing now is to cross that river. And all this other stuff, it's already been figured out. It's, for him, it was common sense. I hate that phrase, but that's, for him, it was common sense. And we just need to apply it. We need these enlightened few men, of course it was men, to get together again with their rifles and go overthrow the government. And he had, he had, he had allies in this. Oh, yeah. His conspiracy, I mean, they never numbered more than like maybe 1,200 people, <laughs> but he, he did have a very devoted following, and beyond the ranks of his immediate followers, 200,000 people came to his funeral. A lot of people respected him. Not just in France, but there were Russians, there were Germans and English as well, and Italians. I mean, I'm not actually defending, I actually think it's important to develop a way to understand the world, but I'm just trying to tell you why he didn't. And that's, that would be, that's not something I actually want to do. I'm not for actions for action's sake. I think that's actually a very bad approach to these things. I think you actually need to do action in conjunction with strategy and line of march where you want to go with it, that kind of stuff. I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm saying why he didn't do it. Well, thanks for your help of bringing him back into the public eye. I hope the book does well. I do too, and if people want to buy it, we can get a copy. So, but thank you again for inviting me. A lot of people left. A lot of people left because it usually doesn't run quite this long. But it was a great question and oh. answer session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your questions, and I hope my answers were somewhat good.